This video describes the new factorial repeated measures ANOVA procedure in StackGraphic Centurion 17. Repeated measures experiments are experiments in which more than one measurement is made on the same experimental subject. There are two types of factors in these experiments. There are within subject factors which have multiple levels for each experimental subject. And there are between subject factors which have only a single level for a particular subject. This slide shows a typical factorial repeated measures experiment. It's from the UCLA Institute for Digital Research and Education. In the experiment, 30 subjects were randomly assigned to two different diets and three different types of exercise. They were either assigned to a low-fat diet or a not low-fat diet. The three types of exercise were at rest, walking, and running. Each subject's pulse rate was measured at three time points during their exercise, at the beginning, after 15 minutes, and after 30 minutes. I've loaded the data into the Stack Graphics data sheet. You can see I have columns for subject, exercise, and diet, and three columns for the measured pulse rates for each individual. To access the factorial repeated measures ANOVA procedure, I'll go to the top menu and select Compare, Analysis of Variance, Repeated Measures Designs, Factorial Repeated Measures ANOVA. There are two data structures that I could use. The multiple data columns structure is the one I'm using here, where all the measurements for each subject are in the same row. There's also a data and code column structure, where all measurements are put in a single column, and a second column is created identifying which time corresponds to each measurement. When I push OK, the Data Input dialog box will appear. There's a field labeled Response where I'll put the names of the columns containing the repeated measurements. There are two fields for specifying between subject factors. In this case, Exercise is Factor 1 and Diet is Factor 2. Finally, I need to indicate which column contains the subject numbers. The next dialog box that appears is the Analysis Options dialog box. This allows me to put in more specific labels for both the response and the within subject factors. I'll put in pulse rate for the response, time for the within subject factor. Finally, I'll see a list of tables and graphs. The defaults will be fine. When I press OK, it will do the analysis and open up a new analysis window. The first pane I'm going to look at is the profile plot in the upper right. Here you see each of the measurements plotted versus time and identified by the type of exercise. The order of the exercise at the moment is alphabetical at rest, running, and walking. If you want to change that order, you can press the right mouse button, go to analysis options. And I'm going to take walking, drag it above running, and press OK. That gives me what I would think would be a more logical ordering for the factor. You can see, of course, that the pulse rates of the runners appear to be quite a bit higher than those who either walked or did nothing. To determine which factors are statistically significant, I'll put the profile plot away and double click in the upper left to display the analysis of variance table. I'm particularly interested in this section of the table here, which has a line in it for each of the main effects, exercise, diet, and time, and various interactions. 
you can see that the between subject factors, exercise and diet, are both statistically significant. Their p-values are quite small. There's also a significant interaction between those factors, between exercise and diet. The within subject factor is also statistically significant, as are a couple of the interactions. The only interaction with a p-value greater than 0.05 is the interaction of time with diet. You may have noted in the analysis of variance table that there were two error terms, one for the between subject factors and a second for any effects involving the within subject factor time. An additional complication arises when interpreting the significance of the within subject effects, and that is that the random errors from one time period to another for measurements made on the same subject may not be independent. If they're not independent, this could invalidate the standard F tests in the ANOVA table for any effect that involves the within subject factor, unless the data exhibit a property known as sphericity. A sufficient condition for sphericity to be present is something called compound symmetry. Compound symmetry implies that the variances and covariances of the repeated measures are equal to one another. The standard solution to this problem is to start by using Mockley's test to determine whether or not it is reasonable to assume that sphericity is present. If it is, then we can use the standard F test. If it's not, then there are two possible approaches. We can either apply an epsilon correction to the degrees of freedom in the F test, or we can perform a multivariate significance test. Let's return to stack graphics now and put away the analysis of variance table. I'll now click at the bottom left to display the sphericity tests and adjustments. At the top, you will see Mockley's sphericity test. Mockley's W is distributed as a chi-square statistic. If the p-value is less than 0.05, then we would reject the idea that sphericity was present in our data at the 5% significance level. In this case, the p-value is not significant, so we can believe the F-tests in the ANOVA table that we saw before. Had we obtained a significant result indicating that sphericity was not a reasonable assumption, then we could do one of two things. The first would be to select an epsilon correction. Epsilon is a number between 0 and 1 that corrects the degrees of freedom in the F-tests. There are three possibilities listed here. One is the Hung Felt Epsilon, a second the Greenhouse Geyser, and a third a lower bound. It's common if the epsilons are large to use the Hung Felt correction which in this case is no correction at all. Or if we wanted to be a little more conservative, we could use, for example, the greenhouse geyser. In the table below the epsilons, you see the tests of the within subject effects. If you picked, for example, the greenhouse geyser correction, then this p-value here would be used to test the statistical significance of time. Included in this table is time and any interaction involving time. An alternative approach would be to use a multivariate test, the same sort of test you use if you were doing a MANOVA. A common test to use is Wilkes Lambda, and you can see there's a p value associated with each of these effects. 
all the p-values, the univariate tests and the multivariate tests, are quite small except for time by diet, confirming what we saw in the analysis of variance table. Once we know which factors are statistically significant, we can then compare the means at different levels of the factor. One approach is to use the multiple range test, such as Tukey's HSD test, to determine which means are significantly different from which others. If the within subject factor, however, is time and the values are equally spaced, then we might instead assume a smooth trend over time and estimate its form. Let's return to stat graphics and select from the list of available tables and graphs a means plot and an interaction plot. The means plot will show the means at each level of a factor, such as exercise, with some type of uncertainty interval. By default, it's an LSD interval, but I'm going to push the right mouse button, go to pane options, and ask for two keys HSD intervals instead. The way to interpret these intervals is to look at any two means. If the intervals for the means overlap, as they do here for at rest and walking, then there's not a statistically significant difference between those two means. On the other hand, running does not overlap the intervals for at rest and walking, so running is significantly different than either at race, rest or walking. I can also change the factor that's plotted along the x-axis by pushing the right mouse button, going to pane options, and selecting diet instead of exercise. Again, you see there's no overlap between the intervals for low-fat diet and not low-fat diet, indicating a statistically significant difference between those two means. Since the analysis of variance table also indicated that there were significant interactions, I should examine the interaction plot in addition to the means plot. This interaction plot shows the mean pulse rate for all individuals in my experiment, classified both by exercise and by diet. The fact that the lines are not parallel is indicative of, of a significant interaction. You'll notice there is some difference between a non low-fat diet and a low-fat diet for the at-rest exercise people, and it's about the same as the difference for the walking people. But when you get to running, the difference between the two diets is much more substantial. That's the interaction. I can also look at interactions involving time by pushing the right mouse button, going to pane options, and selecting, for example, time by exercise. Here you can see that as time goes on, there's not much difference in the pulse rate for either the people who were at rest or the walking people. However, the pulse rate increased quite dramatically for the runners. The other interaction is time by diet. And here you see again the substantial difference between low-fat dieters and not low-fat dieters after 30 minutes. Since the within subject factor time is continuous and the levels of time are equally spaced, we could think of fitting a function to these means. To do that, I'll push the Tables and Graphs button. I'll ask for a trend analysis and a trend plot and press OK. The trend analysis will take a particular between subject factor like exercise 
and fit polynomials of different orders to it. The p-values in the table will tell me whether or not the highest order term for a particular polynomial was statistically significant. In this case, neither the linear or quadratic models showed any statistical significance for either the at-rest subjects or the walkers. But for the runners, both the linear and quadratic terms were statistically significant. The p-values are quite small, well below 0.05. Here's a plot of a linear trend fit to the subjects for each of the three types of exercise. If I push the right mouse button and go to pane options, I can make it a quadratic model instead. You see here that there's not much change over time for either the at-rest subjects or the walkers. But the pulse rate does change substantially for the runners. To see the differences between the diets, I can also ask for a quadratic model to be fit for the two diets. And here you see that there is a growing difference between the low-fat dieters and the not low-fat dieters as the exercise time increases. The factorial repeated measures ANOVA is a powerful tool for looking at experiments in which multiple measurements are made on the same subject.